So pretty much everything in my whole life changed when I started killing bees. Killing bees. Let me go back just a little bit. About four years ago, I was asked to cater an event for a project of, uh, it's an organization that, that teaches children about the importance of honeybees in their lives. And the fact that honeybees are responsible for a third of everything that we eat. Every third bite that we take depends on honeybees. So for this event, I thought, well, I'll uh, just only use things that wouldn't exist without honeybees which was interesting to me. Avocados, apples, oranges, lemons, limes, grapes, um, all kinds of things. Potatoes. And at the end of it, um, the person who did the event said, well, you ought to you know, go to bee school. And I thought, well, you know, bee school, sure. It occurred to me that I really probably, being a food person, should know more about honeybees because basically a third of everything I was cooking wouldn't be there without these things. So I went to B school, um, signed up for B school, paid my money. Right off the bat, I said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to be a beekeeper. And I bought a jacket, and I ordered the stuff. I ordered a bee, the bees. I got a smoker. Um, you know, I picked a nice place in my backyard. And um, on April 28th, my bees showed up, and I was a beekeeper. And I thought I looked cool. I got to wear my red boots. That's me um, putting in my very first hive of bees. And I put them up in my, um, way up in the backyard of my house, because I'd read that they needed dappled light. So there they are. And they looked great, you know, don't you think? It's like, wow, ha, I'm a beekeeper. Well, the bees at the end of the year died. It's like, but everyone was having trouble with bees. I mean, we've all heard about colony collapse disorder, and we've heard about um, there was a, a drought that year, and everybody's bees died. So I thought, well, you know, I'm a real beekeeper. All my bees died. I'm just like everybody else. So I decided I'd give it another shot, and I ordered, I went to bee school again just in case I'd missed something the first time. <laughs> I already had all the stuff except for the bees, so I ordered more bees from this guy who, um, said that he would put them in for me because at that point I had decided I was going to ride my bicycle, not my horse, uh, across the United States. Uh, 3,100 miles. I don't know how many steps it was, and it was about 48 days. So it was a little, little slower than, or faster, I guess, than your trip. Um, and so, uh, which was all about ovarian cancer. I'm a survivor of that, and I'm happy to be on that side of that particular line. So, but, so I came back. John had put the bees in my hives. They sat up in my backyard. They looked great. It's like, dang, I'm, this is so awesome. I mean, that you get bees, you put them in your backyard, and you're a beekeeper. And I felt like the queen, really, you know. <laughs> I must be the queen bee. But again, at the end of the year, my bees died. And I, again, there was, a, there was way too much water that year, and other people's bees died. But this time, the first time John, when he put my bees in, took the dead bees out. The second time, I took the dead bees out. And it was awful, taking handfuls and handfuls and handfuls of dead bees out. And I remember them being alive, and I thought, I, I can't let this happen again. I can't do this again. And John said, you can't just have bees up in your backyard. They're living beings. You can't just ignore them. They need more. They need your love. They need your attention. You can't do it this way. I went to bee school again, but I didn't, I didn't really think I needed, it's, it's not like I learned anything in bee school except that I was determined never to have a year of dead bees again. So one thing I found out was that bees don't like being in the backyard, and they don't like being in partial shade. They like being in full sun. And so the first thing I did was I moved those beehives to my front yard 
so I see them every day when I come in. They're, they're, that's my driveway, you can see, and there they are right there. And I started learning about what happens inside the beehive. Pretty much, the first thing I learned was I didn't really like the job of queen. The queen's job in the world of bees is she lays eggs. She lays 1,500 eggs a day, all day long, every day, for her whole life. She goes out once, mates, once, well, actually, she made 17 times, but it's one, one day or two. And then she gets the DNA. <laughs> Don't get me started. She, uh, this is not that kind of talk. This is not the birds and the bees. This is just the bees. So, but she goes out and she mates with a 17 or so drones, gets the genetic material of those drones, comes back, and then for the rest of her life, lays eggs, 1,500 eggs a day, with drone number one's genetic material on the first, high, uh, first cell, and then it's, it's a remarkable thing, but she's inside all the time. The drone, well, he doesn't get such a great job either. He gets, maybe he gets to be one of the lucky guys who mates with the queen, but after that happens, he is dead. Well, and if, if he's a drone that's in the hive that doesn't get to go flying out on one of these mating flights, at the end of the year, the worker bees say, hey, Buster, you're not doing anything, and he, they kick him out and he dies. Well, that didn't seem very good either. Then I started paying attention to the worker bees. And the worker bees, as I realized it, have this progression of jobs. The very first job that they have when they are born is they are, they get up and they make their bed, basically. They clean out their cells, getting it ready for the next bee that's gonna be hatched in that cell. And the very second job that they get on day three is their undertaker bees. Now, for me, my parents died when I was young and I didn't really get to process it as an adult, but a lot of my friends are adults and they're processing their parents' age and dying times right now, and it's awful. I think it's a lot more sensible to get that over with, like on day three. <laughs> now, the next job that they have, don't you think? Come on. The next job that they have is taking care of the queen. I think we all need to know that there is a boss sometimes, and that person might need respect. In the case of the bee, the queen bee, as the workers in, get involved with her, they touch her and they get her pheromones, which get spread out throughout the entire hive. And then all the people in the hive know that they belong to her. The next thing that they do is a pretty interesting stage. They are the house bees. They, um, they make the honeycomb. They are heating and air conditioning. Inside a beehive, it's 95 degrees, summer and winter. Wintertime, summertime. It's pretty cool. They, um, air conditioning. Well, one of the jobs that they do at this point is that they go to the entrance of the hive and they greet the foraging bees who are out collecting things and they take the nectar from the foragers and put it in their honey stomachs, combine it with an enzyme, take it into the, bee the cells and transform the sugar from the nectar into the sugar that's honey. Also at this point when they, the nectar has 80% moisture content and honey has 17% moisture content. So when that honey, the nectar gets put in those cells, it's very too wet. But those bees' job then is beating their wings and evaporating the water so that when it's 17%, bam, there goes that cap on there and there's honey stored for the winter when they need it. This is the time when they're the cooks. They then progress to the jobs. They're, they become soldier bees and guard bees. Do not come into my hive if you do not belong here. You don't smell right, you cannot come in. And then they become field bees, and the field bees go out in the world, and they get the pollen and nectar and bring it back. One of the things that they do when they go out is they come back and they tell the people who are in their hives what they found. 
they do this doing the waggle dance, which I think is kind of fun. You've heard about the waggle dance? I don't know. Is that how? <laughs> but what they do is they say, go south, till you get to that big maple tree, hang a left, go down, you'll find an awesome tulip poplar tree, and then the, they come back and the bees then follow that. I mean, it's, they go out and they come back. And another thing that they do when they're out there is they pollinate. They figure that a bee, every time she goes out, touches 50 to 100 different flowers. Here she is coming back with pollen. Now, what's really interesting to me, and you may not be able to see this because it's very small, but inside this necklace is 1 12th of a teaspoon of honey. 1 12th of a teaspoon of honey is the amount of honey that one worker bee will make in her entire life. An insignificant amount of honey. We each eat about a pound and a third of honey per year. As I've been paying attention to the progression of the jobs inside this beehive, I sort of reflect on the jobs that I've had in my life. First of all, I always get up and make my bed. I'm a cook. I teach. I cook some more, but I cook inside my kitchen and out in other places. I share the messages that I find. And lately, I've been in a position where I get invited to places and tell those people about Asheville and tell Asheville about these people that I've met out there, which to me means that right now I feel like, um, well, maybe I'm the pollinator. <laughs> but in the course of my life, I've been the housekeeper. I've cleaned the bathrooms in my shop many, many, many times. I'm the heating and air conditioning girl, that's for damn sure, huh, Chris? <laughs> uh, you know, I'm the cook. I do all these things. And what it occurs to me is that I do not want to be the queen bee. And the queen bee is not who I am, nor, nor, nor is that a place that I think is a great spot to be. But the worker bee, the person who gets to go through life with a progression of responsibilities and involvements and abilities to go out and explore and come back with what she has found. The motto of my business is don't postpone joy, which means a lot to me personally for many, many reasons, not the least of which because I'm a cancer survivor twice. But if I think about how, how do you live a life of joy, I feel like I found that, I found the answer to that question by following what I'm learning with these bees. And we're still in year three, which is basically year one. And I, I would love to say that it's next year and the bees made it. I'm praying that they do. They're a lot better off than they were. They're very healthy and strong. But it's given me enormous amounts of joy to be a part of this and to understand that this possibly is where I fit in. And even though this is a really insignificant amount of work, a twelfth of a teaspoon of work, which is one worker bee's life. This is where it lives, and I feel like it's enormously significant. So, don't postpone joy. Thank you. <laughs>